All right, looks like we have a good group of folks here on the call. I'm going to get started, and as more people join us, um, they will get caught up as we go. Um, so thanks so much for joining us for Giraffe 101 for Planners. This is the first time I've been able to run this training, so I'm really excited to help show you all the um, some of the planner tools and planner workflows within Giraffe. Um, if we haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, I'm Holly. I am the customer success manager for uh, the North Americas and Europe. Um, and I am really excited to dive in here today. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to unmute and interrupt me. I won't be offended. Um, if you don't want to unmute, you can also ask me a question in the meeting chat and I will get to those as I go. Um, and uh, if you want to try to follow along in your instance of Giraffe, feel free as well to log in perhaps on another tab on your computer and just try to um, do what I do as you go. Um, okay, with that, let's let's take it away and get started. Um, so today we are going to explore the steps to do a little scenario plan in, um, in Giraffe. I'm going to do this in Toronto. Um, they have some really great geospatial data available publicly, so I love doing projects in Toronto. It's really fun. Um, the steps we're going to go to today are defining a study area, applying land uses, optimizing the design, and then sharing our results. Um, so let's just dive in here. Um, so the first step, as I mentioned, is to define the study area. Um, so what's going to be important for that is to um, just take a look at our city and see where there's perhaps an area that might need some optimization or some additional attention. Obviously, if you are truly a um, truly a planner, um, you'll have a study area in mind already, so you can just jump right to that area. Um, on my screen, you're seeing the giraffe home screen, which is your spatial filing cabinet. It's where all of your projects live. It's almost like Zillow for your projects. So you've got this really nice um, gallery of your projects over here on the right-hand side. You've got some spatial layers so you can explore. And you can also see those projects mapped here. I have a couple of projects in Toronto, so you can see those called out on the map. Um, and then I can also just search for an area on the map as well. So um, if you had a specific address that you wanted to go to, you could type that in here. For instance, I could go to the CN Tower and it'll just pop me right over there. Um, Today, I am going to take a look at a study area over here. Um, you can see that I have tested a couple of projects here already, so you can see those on the map. Um, but let's just uh, start that project up. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is now that I have gone to my study area is I'm just going to click the big orange new project button up here in the top right. That is going to take me out of home and start putting me into my project space in Giraffe. Um, you can see here that I have a few different templates that I have already set up in this workspace. Your workspace administrator can help you set up templates, and those templates are going to contain really helpful um, information that you might want to use over and over again. For instance, it would contain um, all of the spatial layers that you're commonly using. Um, it would contain any land use uh, assumptions that you want to save. And it could also include any custom calculations that you want to start up each project with. So it's really great first step in draft once you sign up is to actually get your workspace administrator to help you set up a template and it'll make everything much more streamlined as you go. Um, I'm going to grab my Toronto planning template, which I have set up already with a few layers that I want to use today. So now that I've loaded up this template, you can see my spatial layers start to load in here. Um, 
And I am actually next week doing a webinar all about spatial data. So as planners, you're probably quite often um, uh, using data from your local GIS department, or maybe you even are the GIS person in your um, government area, or um, you know, you're getting that information from your clients if you're working at a consulting firm. Um, you can load all of that data into your giraffe workspace to be used over and over again. Um, giraffe does have a lot of data that we've added that is just publicly available data and we've linked to it and made it available to everyone in giraffe. But never to worry if you upload something into giraffe, it will not be publicly available unless you explicitly reach out to someone on the giraffe team and say, hey, share this with everyone. Otherwise, it will only ever be in your workspace. So if there's um, anything confidential that you're working on, never to worry, you have complete control over that governance. Um, so yeah, join me next week if you want to learn more about uploading data. Today we're going to work with some data that I already had loaded in. Um, so what we're seeing here is um, Toronto has a really cool layer that is the sort of zoning allowable building heights, um, which is what these sort of colored shapes are, these overlays. Um, and then they also have just a zoning overlay as well. So if I turn off the height overlay, we can kind of just start to see our zoning information populate. And then lastly, the other layer that I pulled in is just our property boundaries. So if I zoom in a little bit, we'll start to see those lines generate on top of here. Um, and all of this information together is obviously going to be really helpful for us as we do this study. Um, my goal today is to do a comparison of what the existing zoning allows versus what maybe we want to propose as upzoning areas. Um, so um, I think today I'm just going to take a look at this kind of strip um, between, what is this street name, between Wellesley and Carlton Street. Um, it looks like there's some vacant parcels perhaps. It looks like there's kind of a mix of usages. Um, so it might be really interesting to take a look. And it's also, you know, all of these buildings are pretty short compared to some of the buildings surrounding. So it might be a good opportunity to take this, um, to upzone this area a little bit. So to define my study area, I'm just going to click on draw boundary to save project and simply just draw a rectangle around this area. Now, if we were doing a um, site specific project, I would want to be far more accurate with this boundary because it affects your um, FAR, FSR coverage ratios, all of those things in your sort of real estate design projects. But when we're doing something this zoomed out, the, you know, the FAR for this entire area as a site is irrelevant. We're gonna do some custom FAR calculations later on in analytics. So I'm just going to then, once I've defined that, click Save Project and give this a name. I'm gonna call this Giraffe 101 for Planners. And you'll see here that we have some additional properties. Um, this information is also set up by your workspace administrator. And all of these elements are things that you might want to track about your projects. So you can set up custom um, fields for your workspace. Like say, maybe you want a field for who is the client, or you want a field for what is the status of this current project. Um, what is perhaps the um, you know overarching goal that your planning department is working on that this pertains to. Um, so you can add all kinds of custom fields and that allows you in your home screen to kind of filter and sort and share your projects based on um, what types of information you have stored on them. Uh, today I'm just going to leave all of these blank and just go to my project. And then here is where you can start sharing this project with your colleagues. So if I had a colleague that I wanted to uh, come in and help me out with this project, I can input their name and just give them access to the project. Um, these different uh, permission sets allow 
people, obviously different abilities within the project. Um, all of that is documented in our knowledge base. I'm going to give James edit permission so that he can come in here and add geometries, add data, notes, um, but he's not going to be allowed to share the project or delete the project. That's basically the difference between admin and edit. So I'll just click invite. If he has free time, you might see him jump into the project in a few minutes. We'll we'll see how that goes. Um, so then at that point, it's going to refresh my tab and drop me into my actual project. Um, it will bring all of the layers that I had in my scratch pad with me um, and sort of set me up with this nicely defined project boundary so I can see where I'm working. Um, for right now, I am going to turn off the zoning overlays so I can just look at these parcel boundaries. Um, and I see a question in the meeting chat about how, um, how you would change the, um, the parcel lines to um, sort of change their styling. So let's take a look at that. Um, in Giraffe, you can query and filter and style your spatial data using the data table or in giraffe we like to call it lens because it's like you're taking a magnifying glass to your data um, so i'm going to just click on the three dots here and do open lens controls and when i do that i get this table that appears that is literally a list of every um, parcel in this data set um, every parcel is a row and then all of the columns here are the data about those parcels that's saved in that data set. Um, the first thing I can do here is style this data set to look a little bit different. Right now it's basically got just an outline and um, a sort of white cast set for the parcels. Um, but maybe I want the outline to be a different color. Maybe I think that gray isn't visible enough, so I want it to be blue. And you can see that that changes. Um, I could change the parcel color as well if I wanted to. Maybe I want it to be green. Ooh, very opaque there. Um, or I could have the parcels color using a color scale instead of making them all the same color. So perhaps the um, by the feature type. Yeah, so they've got some data in here where you can tell if it's a condo or common or if there's no feature type defined or perhaps the plan description um, this specific area doesn't have that so that's not helpful um, plan type yeah there we go there's some data that's useful um, so this just takes uh columns within the data set that have uh values assigned it allows you to color the parcels based on those values if i open this up i will see those um, different plan types that are defined in this data set so it just gives me a little bit easier of a visual if i am especially working on a specific um, it looks like in uh, Toronto, there's a few different master plans. So this kind of colored it by those master plans. So I can kind of see what assumptions would apply visually very quickly. Um, the other thing I can do with these data sets is actually filter them by different criteria. Um, so if I wanted to say filter this data set to only show me um, the condo, parcels. I just set it to feature type is condo and you can see that all of the parcels that didn't meet that criteria have been dropped out of my screen visually. Um, another type of filter that's really useful and I'm actually going to use today is a geometry filter. And the geometry filter allows you to draw a boundary around the um, polygons within that data set that you want to use and then action those polygons. So you can see I just did a geometry filter. I drew a rectangle around these polygons and now actually everything else in that data set has been turned off. Um, so what I'm going to do with this selection is um, actually, yes, 
So now that I have this selection defined, if I click um, on any of these rows, it's going to select those polygons and you can kind of see it happening on the screen as I select them. But what I actually want to do is select all of these. So I'm going to just click select all. And then I have some options down here of things that I can do with those polygons. One option is to add them to a new project. So perhaps I want to create a whole new project out of these polygons, and that might be relevant for a slightly different workflow. But I have this option to add the selection to the project. And that's what I want to do today. I'm going to copy all of these specific parcels that I want to explore today and add them to my project so that I can control their data in a more granular, granular way using Giraffe. Um, so that is the process of bringing in these parcels for further um, exploration. Sometimes when this happens, the data set has some like overlays that are a little bit funky. So I like to just come in and delete these extra lines that I know are not actual parcel lines. And I can just adjust these to be correct. So I just like to keep this a little bit clean. It's not totally necessary, but um, it's my preference for just cleaning things up a little bit. Um, while I'm doing this, does anyone have any questions about the process I just showed with Lens and the data table? Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, feel free to use the meeting chat or you can even unmute and interrupt me. That is totally fine. Hey Holly, can can you just show again how you get that lens table to pop up? Yep, yep. definitely. Um, so you just click on the three dots next to a layer, and you'll have open lens controls as an option. So three dots, open lens controls. Um, something to note is that that is only available on vector style data. Um, so it will have this little rectangle icon next to the name. Um, you can't use lens on raster style data, which makes sense because it's really like imagery. It's not polygons. Um, so for instance, I can't lens the satellite because there's, there's nothing there to explore in a tabular format. So those, um, when we talked yesterday, you, you showed me the wetlands data and the flood hazard zones. Looks like it's not available for those either. Either is that correct? Correct. Yeah, that okay. that data is formatted as a raster format. Okay. Thank you. What you can do with those particular data sets, though, is um, right click on any shapes that might be pertinent to your specific project and just copy them in manually. You just won't be able to mass copy them. So okay. um, it would be you. the process for that. If there's a shape on the map that isn't um, lensable, in many cases, you can just right click on it and you'll have the option to create that shape as a draft geometry manually. All right. Just had a lot more to clean up than when I was testing earlier. So that's kind of fun. <laughs> um, almost there. Okay. Um, so there's my nice clean um, parcel outlines. And um, now what I want to do is kind of define what the existing condition is of this area. Um, so I'm going to apply some land uses. Um, the first thing to know is how, like, what even is a land use within giraffe? How do you define that? Um, and all of your shapes in giraffe are defined by using a series of properties. Um, so, for instance, I can just draw a rectangle on the map. And this rectangle has, you know, some basic meaning, but not a whole lot. It has a length and a width. It has an area and it's located somewhere on the globe. Other than that, giraffe doesn't know anything about this shape. Um, so if I want to draft, tell giraffe more information about it, I can add some properties. And properties could be something like a height. And that height could be, you know, maybe 20 meters. It could be something like a color. 
and that color could be red. Um, so now the shape has a little bit more meaning to it, but it's still, um, you know, not fully defined. And also adding all of those properties one by one is pretty annoying. Um, it would be very time consuming and very hard to manage your assumptions in an efficient way. So that's why in giraffe you have the concept of a usage and um, a usage is um, just a set of those properties like I just showed you, but sort of saved in a database that you can then apply to your shapes quickly. So for instance, I have in here some land use usages. So I've got my high density residential. You can see that it is the land use type. And within here, there is a set of properties. I could go to each of these shapes and apply these properties manually, but it's going to be much easier to just select a shape and define it by selecting the usage. So I can put in that high density residential. And you can see immediately it inherits all of the properties from that usage. What I want to do today is do an analysis of how many additional housing units I might be able to add if I were to upzone this area. Um, so if I go to my high density residential here, I can see that it doesn't actually have anything about potential units included in this usage. So I'm going to add that custom as part of this project. Um, so I can add a new property to this usage and you can see that there's a lot of properties that are default included in giraffe if i want to search for a property i can just start typing um, but i know that the um the unit properties here are for building usages and it's not going to give me the information i want i actually want units per acre so i'm just going to type this new property name that i want and then it gives me this option here because that property doesn't exist yet to create that property custom. Um, so I get these options to set up um, my assumptions here about that property itself. Um, and I'm not really going to change any of the settings here, except I'm going to add a, um, a suffix here to just help future people using this property to understand what it means. Um, and when I save this, you'll see what that what that does. So you can see here that I've created this units per acre and it's going to give the user an indication that whatever they type here is going to be per acre. So on our high density residential, we might say it's something like 200 units per acre. And that is the value that we are going to assume about this high density residential, whereas perhaps a low density residential. And now I have that units per acre property that I can add in. Might only be like five units per acre. And a medium density would be somewhere in the middle. So a medium density residential unit, whoops, got to type it correctly. Units per acre, maybe we'll say it's something like 80. Um, I am kind of making these numbers up. These numbers might make sense where you are. They might not make sense where you are. Obviously, you as the planner is going to know what kind of numbers are going to make sense for your project. Um, so now that I've updated those with that property, it's now available on this geometry for me to use in custom calculations going forward. Um, I'm going to go through here and start assigning some um, usages. So I'm just quickly selecting a bunch of proper, uh, property outlines all at once and just assigning a usage from the drop down. And as I do this, the um, boundaries will uh, assume the, um, the properties from that usage as I go. Um, I do see a question in the chat that's asking if a lot of places have zoning layers, and the answer is yes. Um, in Within Giraffe, we have uploaded a lot, but also um, the many, many, many municipalities make their zoning 
layers um, available as just open data, GIS, uh, either APIs that you can connect to or shape files that you can download and then um, insert into your draft project. Um, I will actually go over all of my hot tips on how to find data next week at the Giraffe 102 about data. Um, so if you're interested in learning how I like to do some Google Kung, Kung Fu to find uh, different geospatial layers, um, feel free to join us for that one. Um, but yes, the short answer is yes. The long answer is sometimes you have to go sleuthing for it, but um, there are ways to do that. Um, so, uh, I am going to make this a little bit easier for myself just because I'm not super familiar with this area. And I'm going to actually style my 3D buildings using lens again by the type of building. Um, so this is going to make it a little bit easier for me to tell what's already built on these parcels. I hate that color palette, so I'm going to change it to a one that's a little bit lighter. Um, and now I can much more easily see what is going on here on this uh, data set. So um, all of the, I pull this up. Oh, interesting. That purple one is either a house or a church. Um, I can also further investigate this by right clicking on it with lens open and clicking on the shape itself and I can see over here that this is a church so we're probably not going to upzone this I'm going to change that parcel to the community use and just leave it as is it's not going to get any um any opportunities for units there um, but most of these other ones Let's see, 3D buildings. Most of these other ones are just labeled as building. Um, so that might be an opportunity for these other areas to just be zoned as mixed use. Um, so I'm going to select all of these ones and make them, um, for now, a medium density mixed use. That might not be totally accurate to what's happening, but um, we'll pretend it is for the purpose of the demo. I'm going to try to get rid of some of these extra shapes here. There we go. Those are pretty small, but I'll still make it medium density mixed juice. Medium. Oh, these parcels are pretty small. I'll make those the low density residential. I'm just clicking on these and quickly applying them. Okay, so now I've got a pretty good visual at least of what is going on on these sites. Um, the land use usages are just big um, masses basically that show you the maximum height and it kind of gives you an idea of what like the greatest extents could be um, with that use applied. Um, what we want to do is take a look at what might happen if we were to upzone some of these areas. So our mixed use ones especially is probably what we're going to look at today. Um, but to do that, I'm going to need to first create some calculations to see what we even have going on. Um, so before I start going with analytics, just want to pause and make sure we don't have any questions about um, usages and applying land uses to the geometries. Great. If there's no questions, I'll keep going. Um, if you did have a question, uh, feel free to drop it in the meeting chat. Um, so uh, I'm going to here start building my analytics. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, your custom calculations can be saved into your template. So you really only have to set this up once. It's kind of set it and forget it. But it's always a really good idea to see how to build those calculations. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is create a um, a category for my calculations to live within. And this is really just a header 
think of it like your header on your Excel template for perhaps where you have multiple um, sort of metrics with, you know, you've put a header above it. Um, it does group those calculations together. So um, for instance, if you were doing like a cost analysis and you had multiple different cost line items, you can then do something like rolling up a subtitle subtotal or doing a really cool um, like pie chart demonstrating what the, the mix is. Um, but today we're just going to take a look at this as if it was a title. Um, now that I have this category, I can start adding measures. And in analytics, the measure is your calculation. Um, it's created from a combination of properties in your project. So remember that uh, units per acre property that we put in, we're going to be able to draw that into our project. Um, and uh, it's a combination of those those properties we created and also just the geometric properties of the shapes that you drew so obviously all of those land use masses that we drew have an area they have a height they have a volume you can draw all of that information into your custom calculations to use um, against those properties you applied to those shapes um, so the first uh property i'm actually going to put here is i'm just going to convert my um, gross areas into acres um this is something that uh won't be as applicable if you are using metric but it is very common in the us for everything to be in acres so we're just going to do that um the and what i am going to get here is the sort of building area acreage um and that's going to help us then create that uh, units per acre calculation that we were uh, driving towards this whole time. So the property I'm going to bring in is gross area. And I'm going to bring it in in feet because we're working in Imperial here. And then um, if anyone knows, the if anyone works with acres regularly, you know the acre conversion off the top of your head. Um, so I am going to bring in my acres here and um the way that you uh reference this property that i have selected here is this component got assigned a letter and i can then reference this property by bringing that letter into my formula so what i'm saying here is divide the gross area by this conversion factor um, for acres and my result is going to be that there are eight acres total in my project that we're looking at. Um, so that is helpful um, just as an overall overview. Um, and then what I'm going to do next is create that uh, potential dwellings per acre calculation that we talked about. So units per acre, and I'm gonna call this current. Um, actually, I don't need to do that. I'm just gonna call it units per acre and give it um, the unit du. Again, just like we looked at before, if you want to create a unit that um, you don't have yet, just like the properties, just type, and it'll allow you to just create it right there really quick and easy. Um, so that property I'm going to bring in is my units per acre. And then I'm also going to actually bring in my um, my units per acre, I'm going to bring in actually the gross area here and do that full calculation inside. So here you can see I have two components. I want the units per acre. Right now I've got the gross area as a um, as the uh, um, amount that I'm bringing in here. Um, so what I need to do is divide this A divided by B but the B needs to also be divided by that acreage. Um, so I'm going to get my gross area equals, yeah. So I've got a lot of potential units here. Um, that's not surprising. Um, so just save that. Um, and 
that seems like a lot to me. So I feel like I'm doing this calculation wrong. Someone shout if I if it's obvious what I'm doing wrong. Sometimes when I'm talking, I my math gets all backwards. So forgive me on that one. Um, but the important thing here is actually going to be comparing the existing um, to the potential. So regardless of if the specific calculation is right or not, um, we can still compare that. So I've got everything right now drawn on a single drawing layer. What I'm going to do is add a second drawing layer and maybe call that um, upzoned, create that. Um, and I can then, I'm gonna do this where I just copy everything on this layer and I'm gonna paste it onto the upzoned layer. So now I have two versions of this. I've got my default and I've got my upzoned. Um, I'm going to then select some of these shapes and turn them into a different zoning. So instead of my um, medium density, I am going to make this a high density residential um, and maybe make these all these little tiny end units also a high density residential. And um, probably don't want to put anything higher density next to this church. We'll let them be. Um, but, you know, maybe this this block of three here could also be up zone to a high density residential. Um, so now our potential here is much higher than it was at the start. Um, the analytics by default is calculating the totals across the project, regardless of what layer it's on, regardless of if that layer is visible. Um, so you'll notice now that my acreage is actually twice as much as we really want it to be. Never to fear, um, what we are going towards is being able to compare these two values side by side. So I'm going to hop into the settings for analytics, and I have this option to split my analytics by layer. <clears throat> and as soon as I do that, I get this really powerful visual of the default being the existing and having about 10,000 potential and the up zoned adding about 8,000 potential um, units to this uh, eight acre site. So it's really easy to then communicate that to <clears throat> to the stakeholders, um, which might be the people living there, might be your client, might be, um, you know, uh, potential investors if it's a target area. So being able to demonstrate those in numbers, really helpful. Um, of course, being able to demonstrate it visually is also really helpful. So right now, what we're seeing is the potential and the existing layered on top of each other. It's kind of hard to tell what's going on. Um, so what we probably want to do is create some views that demonstrate the existing versus the potential. Um, so I'm going to adjust my camera a little bit to get the view how I like it and um, just jump into views. And I'll just click add a new view. Um, and it takes a second while it's reading everything on my site to start. There we go. And I'll just name this existing and save it. And what's really cool with views is not only is it saving your camera angle, it's also saving your layer states. So if I come over here to my layers and turn off default and turn on up zoned, I get that up zoned view. And then I can add a new view here. That is my up zoned save it give it a second to save and now i can switch back and forth between these two conditions and really quickly visually see what the um, change to the character is going to be um, the other really cool way of using views and analytics to present like we were talking about um, bringing in your stakeholders is to create a report. So I am going to now bring this all together, turn it into a beautiful presentation that you can use to um, share with your stakeholders. 
So I'm just going to add our report builder app and jump in there. And I'm going to create a report um, and I want the, actually want the um, two over two here. So I'm just adjusting what slots I have available on this sheet. And then I'm going to add my views. So I'm going to add my existing view to this first slot, my upzone view to the second slot. And then I'm going to add my analytics down below. So I can just add those calculations that I created. Um, and I need to tell it to split by layer, just like the analytics did. And then I will see my default and my upzone side by side along with the imagery. Um, now that I have this report created, there's a ton other I can do with the report. I can add text, I can add images, I can change the styling, um, but it's, you know, really excellent because as these numbers and as your views update in your project, the report just updates along with it. So you don't have to constantly export things and like retype it into InDesign or, um, you know, send the image to your marketing person and have them put it into your report over and over again. You have control over it right in your giraffe window. And then you can just print that as a PDF um, and email it off to anyone who might need to see it. Um, so that is uh, kind of the workflow for doing a little um, scenario plan in Giraffe. You would first define your analysis area. Um, then you would, using Lens, bring in any of the um, data and shapes that might be uh, useful for your analysis. Then you create land uses in usages um, and add any more properties that might be applicable to your specific project and apply those usages to your shapes. Um, and then you create any custom calculations that you might need to do for your specific analysis. Like in this case, we did the units per acre. Um, and then, you know, you can create multiple scenarios. I did two scenarios here with two drawing layers, but you can do as many scenarios as you want and compare them all side by side in analytics. And then I created a little PDF report that makes it easy to just download everything and uh, send it to folks who might want to see it. Um, so with that, uh, it concludes what I was planning to show today in the Giraffe 101 for planners. Um, I really hope some of you are also able to join us for Giraffe 102 to look at data um, and layers in specific, because I'm sure that'll be really useful to you. Um, and we have here about 15 minutes left. Um, so if you do have any questions, feel free to hang out. You can unmute and ask me questions, whether related to this webinar or not. Um, but otherwise, that concludes our presentation for today. And uh, thanks so much for joining us.